Okay, so the first thing to share is when I started thinking about putting these slides together, I came across Action on Addiction. So that is um, an organisation and they are trying to get funding um, for addiction services to match mental health services. Okay. Um, and last year, 2023, they, um, you know, kind of did a pilot survey, had about 2000 people, adults that they um, spoke to. And out of those 2000 adults, just over a thousand said that they'd got personal experience of somebody in addiction. Okay. So half of that 2000, they'd, you know, knew somebody was, you know, had an addiction. And then just under half, so just over 800, said it was somebody really close. Um, and I think that took me back a little bit because what we also know about addiction is most of it goes hidden, okay? So most people have an addiction and for a very long time keep it hidden even um, from those around them. So I, th I thought they were quite quite high stats, to be fair. So like I said, most of my experiences working in alcohol. Um, so that's what I'll speak most authentically about, but the principles around addiction and what we can do to support people will cross over into others. So let me just um, move it on. So just to make sure we're all on the same page, which I'm sure we will be, um, when, what we mean by addiction is when we've no longer got control over using a substance um, or in the activity, okay? And without doing this, having this, taking this, um, we can withdraw from it. So it, we might that might be mentally withdrawing or experiencing some physical withdrawal symptoms as well. Um, a few slides later, I'm going to talk about kind of that withdrawal um, addiction, we'll talk a little bit more about dependence as well. Um, but just before we pull that up, I'll come back to the main session. And I want you to start thinking about what are all the things that people can become addicted to. So head to the chat, if you will, and pop in what are the things that you think people might be addicted to. I've already mentioned a couple, alcohol, drugs, um, and I threw in gambling there as well. So that's three to start us off. But what else do you think? Definitely food, Leslie. Gaming, yes. Probably more of a newer one, isn't it, gaming? Because it's come up more recently. But absolutely, and especially younger people. Yeah, phones, relationships. Yeah, another one for food. Fitness, yes. Social media. Karen, you've got a, a few in there. Food, sex, gaming, physical activity. Yeah. We can be addicted to a lot of things, can't we? Is any of those, if anyone wants to unmute and say which do you think potentially is most problematic? And I've not got an answer for that either. But I don't know if anyone wants to throw anything in about actually some of those that potentially look like not too bad things. Fitness, shopping. Temporary addictions during pregnancy. Yeah, Claire. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, um, um, obviously they're all problematic, but mm. I think things like food, that's really difficult for people that have struggled with addiction to food because you have to have food yeah. to survive. So um, like with a lot of the other things, you can there's tools to try and help you eliminate them from your lives, but you can't do that with food. Yeah, absolutely, Claire. I always say the same. Um no matter how hard it is to stop taking alcohol, stop taking drugs, um, you know, to stop gaming, actually we can survive without these things. There is still an element that we do have to eat um, and that's really hard because often finding that balance um, is the most challenging part. Stacey, you popped your hand up. Do you want to jump in? Um, hi, yeah, I think um, also it's the impact on other people and the either not being aware of that or over aware of that um so you know that's a massive part of that addiction absolutely yeah sorry that's sorry Stacey yeah you're absolutely right I think um we used to say in the alcohol service for every one drinker um on average 15 people were affected and I guess you can see that can't you if you think about who might be in a family unit and then maybe wider family and friends on average there might be about 15 people that are impacted by that 
obviously some people will be less but then some will be more as well so yeah those around them um, and they also have a big role to play in somebody um you know coming to a better place you know maybe coming out of addiction jump back into my slides um and share the next bit so yeah, just a few pictures to bring it all together. Um, and again, you know, probably more recent ones, gaming, phones. 10 years ago, they weren't a thing, were they? We didn't, they we didn't have smartphones. Um, you know, gaming, yeah, it was around my husband and uh, child, my son. They're both big gamers. And they'll tell they tell me that now gaming is a bigger industry than um like music. It's completely taken that over as well. And I'm like, really? Gaming? Does anybody do that? Because that's not me. So I find it hard to get my head around that. Um, but that's absolutely shot up. And people really struggle because games, smartphones, and they are designed to keep us looking at them, using them, aren't they? They're designed to keep us um, uh, interactive. So difficult one. Shopping, alcohol there. We've got um, drugs. Now, um Often we just think of illegal drugs, but actually people become addicted to prescription drugs as well, prescription medication. Um, and I think people taking um, prescription medication in particular for, um, you know, maybe chronic pain and things, absolutely, it can, you know, be, it can, uh, that can happen for some people. Um, I guess the thing to think about is if we can kind of see this in lots of things and, you know, we've started to touch on the negatives, kind of why people still do it. Um, and often that person with an addiction, um, you know, they uh, maybe don't see the bad like we would. Um, does anyone want to kind of jump in and potentially throw out some problems that you know somebody might be encountering if they're if they have an addiction um the impact on their lives the impact on their family finances um you know wanting to stop but can't or actually not wanting to stop because they enjoy it yeah it kind of feels like it'll just take over everything doesn't it mm. Um, and for those on the outside, then that's a really difficult um, kind of, you know, conversation for us because we're thinking, so it'd be better just to stop because actually there's so much, you know, there's so much negative to this. Um, mm. But often that person, they don't see it that way. They don't experience it the same. Um, and I've often heard from people, well, I just want to go back to when it was good. Yeah, and maybe keep doing it, trying to chase that. Um, and actually, that's a really difficult kind of place to get back to. And also, isn't it, um, it's a change of lifestyle, lifestyle altogether, because if they want to quit, that means that sometimes they have to move from where they were so that they don't have to be in contact with the same environment, the same people. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a, it's a lot also to um, do on yeah. top of giving up the whatever it is that they're addicted to. Absolutely, Leslie. It's a whole lifestyle change, isn't it, for a lot of people? Um, and you're right. It might be, well, actually, I can't stay in the same friendship groups. I can't stay in the same area because um, that's it, it, some people, when it gets to that stage, they adapt their lifestyle to being that. So that is the norm. So then trying to get out of that is really difficult. Um, I know there's there's probably not as many around and it's probably not pushed as much. I know when I first started in the alcohol service, um, you know, people maybe went to rehabs or went away for treatment. And this kind of tried to go to more of a community base because actually picking someone up and putting them in um, a rehab, but then going back to the same life, actually they realised, well, that's really difficult. It's equally difficult to change your life while you're there. Um, but there is that sense of, well, I want to change everything around me. Um, and for lots of people, that feels like a really, really big task. Um, yeah, and I can see a few things in the chat box. So, yeah, it'll impact on health. It might be anger, frustration, and somebody refusing that, to admit that they've got an addiction. Absolutely. So lots of things that people, be, people become addicted to. So just a few kind of bits around that then um, and for us to think about. Uh, so a couple of bits there about dependence. So we can be physically dependent and psychologically dependent. 
So um, if somebody, for instance, addicted to alcohol, if they stopped taking alcohol or maybe withdrew too soon, um, because actually we have to think about, you know, breaking it down gently, um, they might be sweating, shaking, experiencing hallucinations. That psychological addiction to lots of different things can be feeling like I need this to relax, I need this to distress, I need this to be able to cope. Um, so body might not have adapted, but mentally we're thinking I need to do this or take this. Um, and that is a very controlling thought that is feels like it's ever present. And, and when we think about um, addiction, you know, it's, a, it's on a continuum. People are at different levels. Um, and the thing with that is that we've also all got a different tolerance. So um, in particular with alcohol, our body becomes used to what we're exposing it to. Yeah. And we'll need more for the same effect. Um, so, I mean, in, you know, a little bit of a joking way, you know, if I said to you all, think about the first time you ever tried alcohol. Yeah. You might have had one glass or two and felt a bit tipsy. Yeah. And um, probably thought, oh, that's disgusting. I mean, younger people nowadays, they've got like really sweet, nice drinks, haven't they? Ciders and different things to, you know, when if I think back, you know, we had beers and wines and that was kind of it. So um, it was quite an acquired taste. And actually, maybe one drink or two would feel like you were drunk. Um, but start to do that a little bit more often over time, that's not going to have the same effect. Yeah. So we we become used to it and we build up a tolerance to it as well. So one of the things that I want us to quickly think about is, well, how we can support people. Um, but if it is often hidden, what do you think stops people from putting the hand up and saying, do you know what, I'm addicted to X and I need some help? What do you think stops people? Yeah, there's a few in the chat. If anyone wants to mute, you can as well, either or. Lots there about shame and embarrassment. Yeah, scared, Ross, absolutely. I think um, another thing that's quite important as well is um, <clears throat> the person who is addicted usually they're not only going through that addiction themselves, but they've got the other obstacle to face, that the trust has gone from all the loved ones and people around them. So they've got that other obstacle to try and um, gain. And then, so they've got two mammoth tasks in front of them and it's like, oh my God, you know, I'm a better off staying as I am. It's easier and doing the easier route. So that must that must be huge um, with the trust element and, and how, how they're going to get help. Yeah, absolutely, Ali. And um, unfortunately, for lots of people, that has gone on for a very long time. You know, it's not just... For a lot of people, it's not just a one-off incident or a couple of days, a couple of months. You know, we could be talking years off um, that that's, you know, been eroded over time or been difficult and um, not wanted to stop. Absolutely. I mean, we got people sometimes sent to us, you know, and I sit with somebody like, do you, do you really want to stop drinking? And actually they didn't. So lots of people don't want to. Some just don't know how to go about it because actually um, whatever addiction it is, well, it's been a part of my life that feels like for a very long time and actually probably a lot of their time is spent thinking around that or doing something around that. So to take that away, what do I fill it with? Because that could potentially be hours upon hours of every day. Um, and that can be hard to think, well, what, what do I do instead? Let me just bring up um, my last slide and then we can talk more about um, maybe people you're working with or kind of experiences you've got. So I want to bring in the cycle of change. So if you've been on our two or four day course, you might have um, seen us talk about this. Uh, but this can be really helpful when we're thinking about what it's like for somebody in addiction and then how we can work with them in a coaching kind of way. So you probably have all or most of you are familiar with cycle of change. So Prochaska and Diclamente's model from the 1980s. I mean, maybe 40 plus years old now, um, but still very relevant. So the, um, they originally put this together um, for thinking about people um, uh, quitting smoking. 
it very quickly became about um, all, you know, alcohol as well. So all sorts of substances. Um, and you'll see on there as well in the writing that um, typically somebody in an alcohol addiction would go around this eight times before making a lasting change. So um, the first point on it is pre-contemplation. That's when we're not recognising that we need to or want to change behaviour. Yeah. So we're carrying on doing our thing, whatever it is, whatever we're taking or doing. And actually, there's not a recognition there that I should change. Now, something might happen, a trigger, an event to get us thinking about it, to move to stage two, which is contemplation, where now we're weighing it up. Now we're wondering about it. Now, for some people, that might be a few comments, yeah, um, about, you know, how much you're drinking, or it might be that you've read an article and now you're a little bit worried. For other people, that might be, well, I've been arrested through my drinking or, you know, potentially social services now I'm involved because they're worried about my children kind of thing. And that will be different for everyone. But it's probably an event that happens that moves us to thinking about change. And then there, the hope is that we'll go on to prepare for change. So actually recognise we're going to need to do something about it. We're going to think about what that looks like. We're going to plan something. And then the next one is moving around to action. So I'm starting to try new things. I'm developing new habits. And then that is maintaining that and keeping going. So if we think about that process of thinking about, of not thinking about we need to change, to thinking about it, preparing for it, doing something different, and then maintaining, on average, somebody would go through that eight times when they're in alcohol addiction because actually they might lapse. So at some point in probably maybe preparation quite often or action, they might think, do you know what, I can't do this. It's going to be too difficult. I just, it's just not happening. Or they might try some things for a little while and it doesn't happen. So they lapse and maybe come back out of the circle. Maybe even go back to pre-contemplation thinking, I'm all right as I am. Yeah. Or maybe still contemplate, I know I need to do something, that isn't working, it's too hard, I don't know what that's going to be. Um, so what is really important for us to do is to understand where they're at. Now, chances are lots of people that you see are maybe in that pre-contemplation, potentially contemplation, yeah, where actually they might not be actively doing anything about changing an addiction. And that's often what I was faced with as well. So... An approach that I would take is to understand what's going on for them. So, well, what's good about your drinking? What does it give you? Yeah, what are all the benefits? Because actually, people that are um, addicted to alcohol, they will tell you some good stuff about it. Yeah, there's some bad stuff, and they can tell you about the bad, but actually, it might stop me thinking about X. It helps me cope with this. When I first started, I did it because this was going on, and now I can't stop. Yeah, it fills my time because actually this is really difficult for me. So it's really important for us to understand well what that is, because from an outsider, we can often see all the negative and think, well, how would you be doing it? But for that person experiencing it, well, actually, there's some good there going on as well. However small, and it might not be as prevalent as when they first started, but there's a reason behind it. So important to wonder what that is. Um, and what I always remember thinking to myself is that, um, and Ali, you've talked about this, you just started bringing it up, thinking about, well, there's going to be um, other people, potentially in the home, that are trying to support them, that are going through this with them, that want them to stop doing whatever they're doing and they, you know, they can't do it. Now, those other people are probably in action, potentially, preparation but they're at the other part of the cycle because they're wanting somebody to change they may be doing things to help them change they may be suggesting things they may be trying to stop things and actually that just creates a conflict now i'm not saying that don't ever jump to that because that's people's probably natural instinct but then when i'm working with people what i try to do is join them in contemplation for a little while because actually me starting to talk about well why don't you do this to cut down why don't you think about this oh well you know I know you've said this is good about drinking but this is really bad so why don't you stop yeah 
I'm I'm another person there moving them around a little bit too fast. So for me, it's always been really important to um, help raise their awareness. And we can do that in lots of ways. Um, I mean, one of my favourites is a bit around decisional balance. So I'm hearing this and you're telling me this, but I'm also hearing this and I'm just wondering what that's like. I'm wondering how that's like to live. So I'm pointing out the good and maybe the things why you're drinking or you're using a substance. But I'm also hearing and seeing that there's some negatives as well. And I wonder what that's like to live in that. So we're just gently trying to raise people's awareness of um, the reality. Because often um, people kind of um, create a false reality because that is probably preferable to thinking, I need to do something about it. Yeah. Um, a few nods, I'm guessing a few of you are thinking, yeah, I understand why people kind of create that reality. So what are your thoughts on that? on that uh, kind of cycle of when people might be at and how we can potentially support them? What it made you think about? If I may, this has sort of hit home because I've got a kind of personal situation where a friend is dealing with addiction <laughs> um, and I'm trying to figure out the best way to sort of help support them. One of the things myself and my partner have helped or struggled with is, is this person is aware they've got an addiction they want to change, but they don't, that they're scared of what happens after the change, which I think is what you've, you've touched on. How do you sort of help support someone to move from the contemplation to the preparation? Because in a lot of these sort of situations, there's usually, a, well, maybe not usually, but there's a, a community of people willing to help support them. Like how, how do you bring up that conversation appropriately without them feeling attacked? Yes, I'll, I mean, it's, Sorry. it's a really, it, no, 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 not at all. It's a good question, um, a really helpful one. And it's difficult, isn't it? Because they're here and probably want to get to here. And actually, that's massive, isn't it? Um, so small steps along the way that they feel able to take, knowing that they've got people to support them um, is probably massive. Um, some people still then struggle to kind of um, reach out with that. Um, it's what brings to mind is a colleague that um, I worked with and he, um, he'd he been addicted to alcohol for many, many years and he'd probably been um, sober for, I don't know, 25 plus, you know, when I finished working with him. Um, and he said to me one time, stopping was never my problem, but never starting again was. Um, and it can be quite hard to stop. Um, well, it, it, can, it is hard to stop, but then to not start again and feel like you've gone back is difficult. So there's kind of loads built up in it. And I think the first time I used to meet people, I'd often talk about what that'd look like and a lapse. Yeah, so there's going to be things you try and it doesn't work. There's going to be times you come back to me and say, Holly, I've started drinking again. There's going to be times when you say, this isn't working and I've got to do something else. And that's okay as well, because it's not going to be linear. So I think there's a few things around supporting them to understand that it's a long process and it's small steps and um, that life does change. And often when we are living a certain life, we can feel it's really difficult to look at anything other than that. But one small change creates a little bit of difference and then a little bit more and a little bit more. And actually, it's okay for that to be difficult and it's okay for it to be challenging and have to start again and things to go wrong. Um, but just taking that one first step, no matter how small, is a is a good start for people. Is that okay, Sam? Yes, that's, that's really helpful. Thank you so much. Oh, thank you. And all the best as well. Um, Jackie, did you pop your hand up? I did, but I think you've kind of answered in that conversation what I was going to ask anyway. But yeah, that's great. I was looking at the um, the the diagram and um, looking at the different stages, and I was thinking, well, what can you, what actions can you take in each of those stages? And some of those things you covered in in that. Um, unless you've got anything else to add in the to the pre contemplation. 
because that's where I'm thinking where a lot of my patients would be at mm -hmm. when they come to see come to me and I'm just wondering what where I can what I can do to support a patient who, who's in pre-contemplation yeah thanks Jackie a few others may have a similar question and if anyone's got any top tips pop them in the chat box please um because you might have some good things as well I think um for me Jackie is is keeping it quite light to start with um, you know, starting that conversation if you can. Or, you know, we always ask about people's drinking. I'm just wondering if you drink any alcohol, etc. Um, you know, that can be a good one to start with. Um, and for me, a lot of that pre-contemplation is just pointing out things. So, um, you know, uh, and and I mean, people coming to me would know that alcohol's an issue. So that's slightly different. But they might come to me saying, well, I'm not drinking anymore. So I might say, oh, I'm just wondering how you're getting on with that. Or um, actually, you, you, I'm just picking up with your body language. You, I, you know, seem a little bit fidgety today. I'm just wondering how you are. Um, and I think the thing with contemplation, uh, pre-contemplation is remembering that not everyone will come out of that. So we can only raise awareness as much as we can and as much as we feel able to. We can't pull somebody around the cycle, no matter how much we want. But for me, the contemplation is being really gentle and being um, pointing out as much as I can, bringing it into the conversation as much as I can and gently pointing out realities as well of what I might be seeing compared to what I'm hearing. And sometimes I'll own that as well and say, I know this is what you're telling me. Um, I'm getting a sense, though, that there are some challenges going on for you as well. Do you want you know, is, is that is that what you're experiencing? Um, but yeah, really gentle approach. And I've just been notified that we're going to be kicked out in 10 seconds. So thank you for joining me. Um, I hope it's been useful. If you want to ask me any questions when we're getting back to main room, just send me a quick message. Um, but thank you all. I